Hey guys! So today I want to introduce you all to a game called Chronicles of Illyria. You may have noticed that I'm not the best at describing things, but I will do my best. Uh, I'll let you know how you can be a part of this really cool upcoming game and how you can join my domain in the game and uh, essentially we can build our own little corner of the world together. But first, what is Chronicles of Illyria? You know I'm just going to butcher this, so I'm taking this information directly from the COE website. This is the main page, more or less I am signed in so it probably won't look like that immediately upon you entering the game. But if we just go to game here, it should give us all the information we require. Yes, here we go. So, what is Chronicles of Illyria? Chronicles of Illyria is an in-development, persistent world role-playing game designed from the ground up to address the many problems and shortcomings in today's conventional MMO RPGs. Rather than being grindy and repetitive, Chronicles of Illyria allows players to make meaningful choices about the role they play in the world and, in turn, their choices have meaningful consequences on those around them. Not just a theme park or sandbox MMO, we define Chronicles of Illyria as an event-driven story MMO with a gripping narrative that is experienced across multiple in-game lifetimes as your characters are born, age and die. With a functioning ecosystem, a closed economy with finite resources and a political system that lets players engage in the dance of dynasties. We believe Chronicles of Illyria is the game MMO players have long been waiting for, a game in which their choices and presence matters in the world. Um, I'm just going to interject here, I'm pretty sure it doesn't mention it at all in this part here. You know, this isn't even the page I wanted, BT dubs. I want an overview. But, <laughs> oh yeah, here we are. This is the page I actually wanted. Um, but I just interject and say that Chronicles of Illyria is a game that's expected to take place over 10 real life years. I know we've had these stupid timelines given before by other silly games, <clears throat> Anthem, but this game works much differently. So in Chronicles of Illyria, one week of our time is one year of in-game time. So over the course of your 52 weeks in a year, your character will essentially go through their entire lifespan. So they will technically die of old age by the end of one year. They can definitely die earlier depending on in-game events and I'm not really going to go into that. That's something you guys can research on your own because there's plenty of information about it uh, on this website and in the forums and stuff, yada yada yada. But it's designed to be multiple lifetimes so you will essentially have a new character every year give or take depending on decisions you make in game so it's really a, a long-term thing it's not just looking at what you can do now it's looking at how your choices now will shape the world two years from now four years from now and so forth so I thought I'd interject there probably getting ahead of myself but this is actually the page I wanted to be on so Quests generated just for your character, a fully destructible environment, closed economy, finite resources and survival elements means Illyria is experienced differently for every player. Each time you log in, there is something new to do. No daily grind. Local, regional and national conflicts are continuously unfolding, giving birth to repeated opportunities for you to change the course of history. Enter Chronicles of Illyria as a member of a player or NPC ran family, then work your way up from a humble adventurer to a lead vassal. Develop your dynasty and work your way to king. FYI, that's going to be freaking hard, but doable. Not interested in running a kingdom? The fully skill-based system and lack of classes means you're rewarded with the ability to create the exact character you want, because who the frig wouldn't want that? Full of dramatic opportunities, Chronicles of Valeria pulls the best from sandbox and theme park MMOs to create a new type of game, an event-driven story we call a multiplayer evolving online world, or meow. <laughs> oh, it cracks me up every time I see that. Anyway, choose your own adventure and an MMO. Yes, I am reading this entire page because it's very informative for you guys. In Chronicles of Illyria, players experience a unique and compelling quest system where personalized, procedurally generated story arcs follow characters no matter where they go in the world. Triggered by surrounding events, the players are free to be masters of their own destiny while still enjoying a role in the larger story. Like a global choose your own adventure book, actions the players take guides the direction of a 10 year story through a proprietary new story system we call story finding. Like the GPS on your phone, the AI guides the players to the next waypoint in the story, giving us the ability to maintain a tight narrative while giving you the freedom to choose which path to take. So this game isn't just going to have, hey, I'm an NPC, come get a quest from me. It's, it's more, uh, you seek your adventure. It may also find you, uh, in a sense, depending on the AI and, and the destiny of your character. Destinies are a thing in this game, which is pretty cool. Again, I'm not going into that, but it's a thing. So yeah, it's not just going to be a point, click, do adventure, turn it in. It's going to be far more involved and, and developed 
and complex and it depends on the choices you make as to how your own story will unfold which makes this game freaking awesome mmorpg meets survival game with limited inventory hunger and thirst drowning and fatigue and dangerous landscapes containing both sweltering heat and frigid cold a character experiences challenges big and small every single day weather and the environment are both mighty friends and foes in illyria depending on your circumstances the riches are real and adventurers can become the wealthiest and most powerful in the world if they can survive the harsh environments chronicles of illyria is built from the ground up to create a shared world that is affected by the choices of its players Player interaction runs deep, and choices can have consequences. Survival gameplay alongside political intrigue and a system of law and government means that danger is not always obvious. Heroes will need to be truly heroic to become legends! Exclamation point! Just, you know, for extra drama. Uh, I hope you're also paying attention to the pictures, guys. This one in particular, because jousting is a thing that I am totally okay about. I don't really know what's going on in this picture, but that I know what's going on with. And we are a chasing wildlife. Probably wouldn't advise that. And this picture here, uh, I think I'm gonna show you the trailer of this game and it will show this scene. And uh, I'm sure most of you, wait, if you're all dudes, you might not. Most of you may recognize what they've crafted this scene around. I will say no more on that. Break free of quest hubs and endless grind. Oh, I freaking hate grinding, so yay. Tired of overly simplistic gathering quests shared by everyone on the server? Are you painfully aware that you and 50 other people are currently doing the same quest for the same NPC at the same quest hub? We're doing away with the NPC quest hubs by enabling other players to give out tasks. You might meet a merchant who has run out of reagents, leading them to ask you to bring 10 elixirs back from a far off city. Our contract systems guarantees that there is payment on delivery. At its most basic level, Chronicles of Illyria is a fully customizable, skill-based action RPG in which the skills you use determine which skills you're good at. So you can't just like AFK your skills. This is, this is an active skillage game. A completely classless system and a skill-based progression means that your imagination is unleashed to play any role you'd like without being confined by your choice during character creation. Which is nifty, because if you don't really know what you want to do, you know, if, upon entering the game, you want to experience the game and get an idea and a feel for how you'll fit in the world, you can do that. You can just get in, chill for a bit in the game and decide, hey, I'm going to be a blacksmith. And then you can just pick up the skill of blacksmithing, you know, you, you don't, you haven't wasted skills and character creation or, or put yourself on a path that you then can't do blacksmithing on. It's all fully up to you. Achieve fame and fortune in a player driven economy. Illyria is a living world with a closed economy and finite resources. This means that the resources in the world at launch are the only ones Illyria will ever have. Use them wisely. Whether you plan to gather resources, process raw materials into crafting components, craft those into items for other players, run a shop, a merchant caravan, or offer your sword for protection along established trade routes, each piece of the economy is run by players. In Chronicle of Illyria's unique crafting system, there is more to becoming a master crafter than waiting on a progress bar. Requiring fast reflexes and good hand-eye coordination, skill challenges for non-combat activities means that some degree of player skill is required for every action a character takes. Which is unfortunate for some of us. <laughs> Join a robust world complete with dynamic NPCs. Ooh, that looks like a kind of a really cool like bazaar or marketplace. Neat. Chronicles of Valyria is the first persistent MMO where the actions the players take have a permanent and lasting impact on their environment. Players can work to gain control over and monopolize a valuable commodity. They can blockade or siege neighboring settlements to force alliances or secessions, concessions, sorry, and they can construct individual buildings or even entire civilizations through our innovative new settlement system. And with robust AI behaviors, the NPCs in the world react to the reputations and actions of the players, remembering past interactions and responding in kind. This is very important for this game. It allows it to be far more realistic and it also allows you to not necessarily be able to determine who is a player and who is an NPC in this game and I find that very intriguing. With no new resources entering the game after launch, players must find and gather resources and craft goods and services for one another. And you can bet it will be competitive. It will be up to players to set far mar fair market value, protect their investments, and pay taxes to their governments to run the country. And it will be up to the warriors of the realms to protect their borders, to hunt down threats, or to conquer other lands. So, 
yeah, there's, there's heaps more, you know, there's a whole FAQ, there's plenty of stuff here. And there's actually heaps of information about here. I mean, we've got all of this about the souls, which is your life system. You know, you've got all your different types of places, your settlements, your people you can be. These are all the tribes you can play. There is so much information on this website. I'm not kidding. There is so much to read. It took me hours to read this when I first started. There is so much here. I highly recommend you guys jump into it. If you want me to do videos on any of that, um, I, I can try by all means. I'm not opposed to doing so, but I don't want to just throw it at you if no one cares. So yeah, this is the game in a nutshell. Yeah. So it was, it was a fair bit of information. I hope some of it has sunk in thus far, but we are far from none. So yeah, I'm hoping that from all that information and those <clears throat> really cool pictures, you can see that this game, Chronicles of Illyria, it, it, it has the potential to be like seriously awesome. <laughs> I can't put it any other way. It just, whether it lives up to expectations or not remains to be seen, but so far it's been pretty cool. And just the plan for it really has me excited for where this game can go. But I guess the main point I want you to take from all of that is that this game is different. It's it's one of a kind. In every other game, you, you play in a world created by the developers. You know, the borders are set as is, the towns are already planned, they're populated. I mean, you as a character, you might be able to purchase property. You know, in, in the case of Skyrim, you might be able to uh, build your own home with one of those um, DLCs. And in some games, uh, you can actually make upgrades to your home city, you know, like Dragon Age Inquisition and a shit ton of other games I can't remember. You can upgrade your home world, but at the end of the day, all you're doing is playing into the hands of the developers and, and the world that they've pre-created. But in COE, this game, it is wholly player made and procedurally generated. This means that the devs have had little input on the design. By the time it is game releases, TBD, <laughs> it will be fully created by the players. So how does this work? So I'll just go into a little more detail. Um, a, a little more detail. Mm -hmm. So this requires a bit of backstory on the game development and, and where we've come from there. So please bear with me. This information, it does matter. <laughs> so people are already invested in this game. For a few years now, it, it's starting right back from the Kickstarter project years ago. Uh, people have been backing this game and buying titles for themselves. So to explain that better, um, I'll show you the servers. There are four servers that you can choose to play on, though usually you would pick the server closest to you to have a reduced ping. So even though this whole video is about me going, hey guys, join me, I really would like your help and to play with you guys and join me on Oceanus. If, if your ping is like nowhere near Australia or the Eastern coast of Australia, it would not be practical for you to do so. I mean, you're more than welcome to, but just know that you may have issues with your ping as a result and have some lag, but that is a decision you can make. But I'll explain the servers. So we have Angelica, which is the North American West server, Luna being the North American East server, Celine being from Europe, and of course we have my beloved Oceanus for the Australia and surrounding lands sort of areas. So Cellbound Studios, they're the developers who are making Chronicles of Valeria. They've created a series of maps for each server. So they didn't just create one for each server. They actually created, I think, I don't know, 10, 12. I don't know how many they did, but they created multiple maps for each of the servers. And then the players who have already sort of signed up for this game, they got to vote on which map they wanted for their server. And these maps weren't maps that were just created by the devs in the usual sense of, you know, fully designing it. They were all actually generated from algorithms. So the algorithm balanced the different biomes that they have in the game. And then, you know, where the land formations are, the lakes, the rivers, valleys, mountains, all of that was all sort of procedurally generated rather than deliberately placed. And once they all selected which map they wanted per server, the devs then had the system generate all the border lines and where the settlements would be. Again, it's through an algorithm, not based on the opinion or design of the devs. I mean, they might have a little input in making the algorithms, but they didn't go, hey, here's a nice place to put a settlement. It was all just AI generated, essentially. So the lands are broken down like this. So on each server, I will pick Oceanus because it's my server. So, oh great, thinking, yay. So on this server, you have, well, mine has four kingdoms, one, two, three, four, but uh, some of the others can have up to actually six kingdoms. So each kingdom here is ruled by a monarch. 
So I'm not just going to Loviscara for the sake of it. It's not where I've picked, but let's just go into it. Just ignore all this for now. So Loviscara. So we have one monarch ruling this place. Then we have Loviscara is divided into duchies. So we've got Akatash, Brothel Rock. These names are not necessarily set in stone. The ones that are not italicized are ones that have been picked by the players owning the territory and are permanent. The ones that are italicized are either the generic generated ones that will probably end up being in the game or they're just temporary names so that when someone claims the land and the name is approved it will change to their chosen name but i digress these are duchies so the, there's a monarch ruling over all of this there's a duke for that duke for that duke for that duke for that etc then if we go in to a duchy you'll see it's all broken down into counties so yes there are some really weird shapes and this is what happens when you have ai generating stuff rather than a person it follows like landforms and stuff so you will get some strange shapes but that's what's cool about this game it just it just goes to show you that it's all done by the lay of the land and by ai more so than a person deliberately setting these borders but each of these counties is run by a count or i guess countess if we're going to be gender specific and then within each county you have the settlements Gosh, we are going slow this morning. Is there a lot of people on this website? Holy hell. Uh, this probably wasn't my best choice. In fact, I don't like this choice at all. Who has the capital of Loviscara? Or at the very least of this particular area. Who has the capital? Where is the capital? That's just a city. It's probably hard because I've gone on a land that's not mine. Eh, let's just go to Darkslay Horn. It's got a city there. That will suffice. So each of these settlements, you'll notice, are different sizes, but each one has a, a person ruling it. Now, if you've purchased a, a title package as mayor, you can choose one of those and, and it is yours. And if those settlements are not selected before the game begins, they're going to be NPC run. So you can go from a hamlet, a tiny little hamlet. It's a tiny little thing. It's got only eight, five to eight parcels and it's only got about say 20 people actually living there. Then we go up to a village size, which goes slightly up in size and population. Then we go into a town size. Again, we're getting slightly bigger. We're probably topping up nearing a hundred, just over a hundred, I guess, depending on your location in size. From there, we go into cities. And for there we go into capitals, but I have no idea where the capital of this joint is and I cannot be bothered to look for it. So capitals just look like bigger than that <laughs> and have a shit ton of people in them. Like on these, these North American servers, holy shit, even I suppose the European one, there are so many people in these cities. It's crazy. And so many players. Oh my God, it's actually getting ridiculous. But that is a story for another day. I was just explaining these are settlements. All of these cost the same amount of money to purchase the mayor title because just any mayor title can claim any one of these. So that is like the hierarchy structure of this land. So now I guess I'm speaking about titles. So these titles have been purchased by players right back since the Kickstarter event and they're still being purchased today. You can still purchase the title, but I'm going to get to that later. So bear with me. This past month, uh, an event called Domain and Settlement Selection, or DSS as we call it, kicked off. Everyone who had purchased a title was able to select their territory on these official maps on their servers. And it went in order of titles. So the Monarchs pick first, and the Dukes, Counts, and lastly, the Mayors. The event itself isn't quite over, like the first phase of it is over. Uh, so the second phase and third, third phase, yeah, no, probably just the second phase uh, is still to come and you guys can be part of that one. But again, I'll get into that in a moment. So what does all this mean for the game itself? Bear with me. Again, we're going into a lot of details here. Three months prior to the official release of the game, every one of these people who have purchased their title and selected their respective land will gain access to the game. Repeat, this is three months prior to the start and official release of the game. We call this three month period exposition. In these three months, these players will establish their cities, their towns, their kingdoms. They have three months to get trade happening, build up their cities, get farms producing them so they can provide food for their population. They are essentially creating the world that everyone else will play in come launch day. So when the rest of the world joins the game on day one, everything you see has been created by players more or less. It is actively being run by players. Again, more or less. As I said, there will be NPCs running the places that weren't selected, whether that's 
a, a kingdom, if there's a kingdom that hasn't been selected, it will be NPC run, right down to a city or a town. If it hasn't been selected or purchased by a player, it will be run efficiently by an NPC. So, you know, there'll be a mix of PC and NPC run places. So the world is shaped by players. I, I find that this is just such a unique premise for a game because we normally just get a world slapped down by developers and this is the world that we're creating and so far for, for as long as I've been a part of this I am loving it I love the concept of this new type of game and, and the world and I'd really love it if you guys could join me but again let me just remind you that if you're not in Australia or the surrounding lands it may be difficult for you to do so in the strict sense of physically putting your character in the same area as mine because of the ping, but that is a decision you can make yourself. And there are still ways that you can support me, so I will explain all of those. So you can still experience the game you want to experience and support me if that's something you feel that you wish to do. But before I get into that, let me just add that COE is not even close to being ready to play. It's still like a year, maybe two years out. So please don't buy into this game expecting to be playing it by Christmas. Okay? So with that warning aside, here's how you join the game. So we'll go back to our main page, back to our main screen. I will log out because that's of no use to anybody. So here we go. When you come into this first screen, you're going to register. You're going to type in your username. This is not going to be your character name. I mean, it can be if you want it to be, but this is just going to be the username by which people will address you in the forums if you post in the forums. There is also a separate Discord for Chronicles of Valyria. It's a massive font of information and just the community there is just <sighs> overwhelming, but kind of in a good way. <laughs> There's just so many people already invested in this game. So... It's nice if you use the same names across both things if you're going to participate in the Discord, but that's entirely up to you. So username, email address, password, birthday. Now here we have something called referral code. It's completely up to you if you want to just not support me. I mean, I'm not going to, not going to force you, nor am I going to know any differently. But if you want to, um, please enter in this code in the referral field. So 963 EFC. I have no idea if it has to be capitalized. Probably to make sure it's capitalized. What this does is this gives me some in-store credit to spend. Uh, you may have seen in the top corner up here, I had $5 of credit. That's from my alt giving myself <laughs> a referral. So I got some in-store credit. This means that I can use that credit to purchase things in the in-game, not in the game store, in the, the store here that will allow me to improve my lands, to improve the place I have selected to help me build up my community. So any contribution will go directly into helping my people, essentially. So if you feel that you'd like to help my people and support my people, please toss in that referral code, sign up for the T's and S's and sign up, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. Uh, I believe, sorry, I've just logged in back as myself. I believe when you first sign up, it asks you which server immediately you would wish to lock to. I repeat, the word is lock. You are server locked. So whichever server you pick, you're freaking stuck. So make sure you're picking the one that is best for you. As I've mentioned for the third time, it's best to pick the server based on your location to reduce your ping. But I'm not going to force that upon you if you want to come join me on the Oceanus server. That's a decision only you can make. Um, but I, I do recommend sticking to your, your local local server for those reasons. This just gets you logging in. What you'll then need to do, I probably, nope, hold up, I'm going to log out again, uh, is head to the store because you'll need to buy a pledge package. Oops. So this game isn't, this game's not free to play, like, duh. <laughs> so the way that they're currently doing this is pledge packages. So ignore the top bar, it's irrelevant at present. So there's lot, this, there were originally three tiers of pledging, but that the highest one has been removed for reasons. We've got the two remaining. So if you just wanna be your basic ass adventurer, chilling in this freaking world, by all means, that's the best way to go for it. In which case, you're gonna be looking at the Illyrium package. So it gives you launch access, so i.e. you get to play the game when it launches. You get one life and three souls. I'm not going into that at the moment, just understand that you can you can put one character in the game yay and you get some other shit that no one cares about so i don't know how much there we go so that would just be 45 us dollars that's all you need to play this game repeat 
This is all you need to play the game because you already get one spark of life so you can immediately place one character into the game. If that's all you want to do, great! If you want to get something a little better, maybe get a pack mule, an adventurer's pack, maybe you want to be a pioneer. And it gets you access to Beta 2, assuming they're still calling it that. It bumps up to 75 USD and so forth. You can be a founder, you get some extra shit. And then Gentry, uh, this is where you can own land. This one's actually a little more important. These guys here, even though you get access to the beta, you, you don't have any influence on the world before day one. You, you can play around in the betas to the heart's content, but nothing you do ever matters until you enter the game day one. These guys here, however, the gentry, are the ones that get the access to the three months prior to release, to the exposition period, and you can help shape the world prior to launch. So Bloodline is the minimum requirement for that, in which case you'll be spending, I believe it's 135, yep, USD. Gives you exposition access plus access to the two betas. So if you're wanting to maybe get a settlement near me, that's what you'll be requiring at a basic level so if that's what you want to do I, and you want to shape the world hit up bloodline now pursuant to this if you want to i should probably explain my land but uh, we'll do that in a second i totally should have told you what land i picked like as if that isn't important but anyway if you want to do this there is something else you're going to have to do in order to be able to claim land and it's going to cost just a little bit extra money if that's what you're wanting because nothing in this world comes for free. Let me just quickly log back in. So I will show you the lands I've picked just for some clarification here. So obviously yes, Oceana server. I am in the kingdom called Tilsia. Now another thing I'd like to point out when you're thinking about if you want to buy a settlement or a title in this game is to realize what kind of experience you want. Each space in this game has a different biome, a different habitat, different wildlife, different animals, different yeah, plant growth, and also the tribes, the, the uh, closest thing to race. We don't, except we don't call it race in this game, they're called tribes. So the tribe you play or you want to play will determine also where you go. I could get into details about that in uh, overview, nope, world, the tribes here, it's all the different ones you want to try. I can, I can do a video on that if you guys want me to, but otherwise just read up on those yourself. So whichever tribe you want will also dictate where you pick. So in Tilsia, which is my kingdom, not me owned, me in it, <laughs> uh, we tend to have the typical human, like the closest to a normal human, normal human, god, I'm so offensive, <laughs> but it's the closest to what we are. The Nirins are predominantly in Tilsia. We also have the Kipix. So if you want to be this weeny bitty microscopic little person, they are the shortest and physically smallest of the bunch. If you want to be one of them, then by all means, Tilsia is definitely where you want to be. They are not particularly prevalent in any of the other territories that I remember. No Kipix, no Kipix. So when you come here, Kipik is, you know, 35% of the population, Niren being 37% of the population. As I said, they're, the, they're your generics, which is what I'm going to choose to be because yay for generic bitches. But yeah, so if you want to be these itty bitty little people, then you can. Are there pictures that I want in this page? Negatory. And we also have, ignoring the Hrothi because they barely exist, we also have Werd in here. So if they're the three tribes, after looking at which ones you want, if any three of those appeal to you, or you just ne go near enough if you can't decide because they're just generic guys, then Tilsia is the place for you. Here we are broken into several duchies. We have Falrun style, which is the duchy run by our queen. FYI, just a bit of back knowledge there, and that's her capital over there. We then have Astellus. I don't know how I actually pronounce it. Astellus, Astellus, Astellus. Mm. It's actually a double duchy. There was a, a line division here, but the Duke had purchased uh, a really, really expensive pack and joined the duchies together. We have Crowfall. That name will be changed. No one has possessed it as of yet, though there are plans in line for that one. If those plans work out, it will be called Ebonvire. If that's how we're pronouncing it. I've never heard anything audibly. I've never seen it. 
We have Akiyama down here, which is more of a shrubland area. And it is, yeah, there are lots of Japanese <laughs> names going on down there. I'm a little confused why, but hey, if that works for you, head down to the shrublands. We have Trabba's Valley. Again, not currently chosen by anybody, uh, but it will, it has, has plans for later on, don't you worry. All of these have plans, guys. Even if they're not actively picked, there's plans. First Night Arch up here. It's actually quite a nice place. This is predominantly Niren, so if you want to be your basic ass bitch like I like to be, this is a beautiful place. It's full of beautiful forests, there's waterfalls, there's great land to be had up in this corner of the world. And then last but not least, we have Green Hollow, which has pretty much a similar situation up here with like the the biome, the, the habitat, but we do have a higher population of weird from the shrublands coming in through to Green Hollow. Again, it hasn't been picked yet, but there are plans. It's going to be called Valera. Valera? Valera? Again, I've only seen it spelt, not pronounced, but that is its tentative name. No one, I have no idea what that's going to be called. So yeah, depending on your tribe of choice, you have a variety of options here. As you can see by the lovely delightful green, I've picked in Balran style, the Duchy of our Fair Queen. You also know, actually I'll just back up a sec. You can also see some of the settlements already from this back view. So you notice that these big massive ones with the two flags are going to be called capitals. They're not necessarily the capital of the duchy, because as you can see there's two here, but only one of them is the true capital. One is just a capital, if that makes sense. And then the other icon you can see is a city. So there's two cities in Fire and Style plus the city, a uh, capital. There's at the moment, only two cities in Crowfall, but that will change in future. Two capitals, etc., etc. So this little city over here, that's mine. That's mine. I can finally point at the map and say, this is me. This is me. So here is our capital in Ashenwood and our Queen's City. Well, Queen's Capital, whatever you want to call it, has been named Arendon. So if you want a place there with the queen in the capital of like the entire kingdom, go right ahead. I am certainly not going to hold you back. That sounds like a freaking cool option. But I am over here in Forest Pot Terrace. It's a shit ass name and you can be sure that shit is not staying. But my names are still subject to approval. So my choices are not yet set in stone. In saying that though, I have attempted to call it Ore. But as in, you know, Marseille, that's the kind of spelling I was going for. It's got a little accent over the eye just because, you know, why not? But that's what I'm hoping to call it, Ore. I'm going for a bit of a dawn theme. And I went through several names that I wanted for that. I was going to go with like Aurelia because it means the golden one in Latin. And there were just heaps of names that I came up with. But I ended up going with Ore. It sort of sounds like the Aurelia at the beginning. And, you know, ray is in a ray of sunlight. Get it? Yeah, I'm lame. Let's ignore that. So that's what I'm hoping to call my county. Now, if we go into the county itself, you'll notice that it has a predominant population of Kipik and a predominant population of Niren. And a few weird, weird, we don't talk about them. Shh. Um, so if you want to play either of these races, again, pick in in my, my uh, territory. Actually, I'll, put, I'll actually put a proviso on that one. I should have been more clear earlier. These populations only lock you if you're looking to own a settlement or, you know, duchy or a county or a kingdom or whatever. But if you're looking to be a mayor of a settlement, these matter. If you're looking at just playing the game, this shit doesn't matter. You can just be whatever we want. If you want to come into Forest Pot Terrace and be a Hrothi, that's, that's totally up to you. Character creation is not going to care. You just do you. But if you're looking to purchase a settlement or a city or a town in the map, then this will matter. But in any case, so inside Ore, as I'm hoping to call it, we have the city of Elk Arch. It's definitely not gonna be called that. As you see here, I'm proposing to call it High Dawnwood. I'm seriously hoping that goes through because I have become very attached to that name. Now, ignore self-sustainability, it's, it's shit. <laughs> it was already shit before I added land and people to it. It just means that this city doesn't currently currently being the key word there it doesn't currently support itself with like its food and its resources you'll notice that everyone here is is has shit ton of self-sustainability and that means that my city is currently outsourcing its food and its resources it's currently getting them from every other settlement in the county 
My plan is to try and change that and try and help the self-sufficiency of my city so it doesn't depend quite so heavily on the surrounding territory. So there you go. There's a glimpse of what I'm hoping to achieve. So yes, it, don't worry about that. It, my plan is to fix it. Uh, I have access to a lot of resources. As a county, I have access to every main resource. So you can log... Okay. Logging? There's a proviso on that. Stone, if you want to dig some stone out. Also minerals, if you're wanting to do all of that thing. I've got clay. I've got fish. Heaps of foraging lands. Heaps of farmlands. The only caveat here is hunting. There's a lot of game, so yay for game. The Kippic are vegetarians and therefore don't eat meat. My population is predominantly Kippic, therefore hunting is not going to be encouraged in my county. If you want to be a hunter, please go somewhere else. I mean, I say that in the nicest way possible. We've got to fit into the law of the area and how the characters will uh, look at you, the NPCs. So I'm discouraging hunting as a whole in my county. We can totally just buy food from somewhere else if we need meat. Um, like if the Nirans want to eat meat. I mean, maybe if, if you want to do it a little tiny bit, maybe that's okay. But don't come in here wanting to be a hunter as your, your time-consuming job. Like, no one is going to look at you kindly as a local. They're really not. But I digress. I'm jumping all over the place. I'm sorry. This is not how I planned on actually doing this. But it's where we've gone from now. So in other words, we have access to plenty of resources in my county. There's no reason why we cannot prosper and become highly self-sustainable. I'm looking at you, city. So there is heaps of potential for my county. I could tell you my massive plans for the city in my county in this video. I won't because this video is getting like really long as it is and I'm starting to waffle and I don't want to waffle. I want to be quite concise in what I tell you because I have a lot of cool plans for my county and for my city in particular and I will probably share that in a later video. But for now, the reason why I'm showing you this is one, so you can decide if you want to place just your character in general in my joint, which I'd greatly appreciate, but that's totally up to you. Again, given your ping, you may not be able to do that. The reason I'm mentioning this is because you can still grab these settlements. You know, if you look at my county, only six of seven settlements have been taken because I've taken the city. These six other places are all still up for grabs. Now, how do you go about this? Well, as I said, part one of DSNS, D and SS, sorry, DSS, has finished. So the simple way of just buying a title, grabbing a land and claiming it is done. Yeah, you can't do it that way. However, we are moving into the second phase uh, early October, mid-October? We don't actually have a date for this part just yet, but in October, hopefully sometime, we're going to have what they're calling Settlers of Illyria. It's essentially a Dutch auction. So every single kingdom, duchy, count, and settlement that is not currently owned by a player is going to go up for auction. So that means that you can still grab all of these places if you so as well one each bumper person you can't buy multiple settlements otherwise i would have done that uh, so there's still time for you to grab this so it, you may also get a discount during the dutch auction or it may also cost you more in the long run the the prices will be set depending on the type so settlements will be set at a range of price the the duchies and the counties will set at their own prices so you're paying for what you're getting so you're paying less for a settlement than you will for a county that totally makes sense, I hope. But these settlements themselves are no longer going to be equal in value. So the price of a hamlet is going to differ vastly from the price of a city. And it also depends on the land you're on and the quality of it that will drive the price up and how sought after the land is. So if it's the last remaining settlement in a county full of chosen settlements, it means the land is sought after. So it's going to have a high value and it's going to drive up price of your settlement and saying that though there are ways that you can get discounts over the time over the span of the auction prices will progressively get cheaper and i think they said for a two or three hour window every single day of this dutch auction they will choose one place at a discount price whether it's a duchy uh, a settlement they might go hey for the next two, three hours, Silver Pole is going to be at a discount rate. So then you can save more money. You can save up to a total of, I think it was 55% of the price. 
if you catch it during that window. It's possible to save a lot of money on these settlements, but it's also possible that you pay a little more. But that is the only way from now on that you can claim settlements if you want to join, well, the game at all, but if you want to join me in my little corner of Tilsia, or of the Oceanus server. So that's that. It's not going to be easy. In-game hours will increase depending on the size of your holdings. So if you have a settlement, you can expect to spend several hours a week managing your settlement. If you're getting a county, that number of hours a week that you must dedicate to the game increases and whatnot. The information's all available online, so you can actually find the number of hours you kind of can expect to play at a minimum uh, per week to manage your holdings. So only purchase a settlement if you can invest the time on a weekly basis into your settlement. If you don't have that time, don't buy a settlement. Just buy your basic pledge package, the Illyrian pledge package. And then when the game launches, just come join us in one of our cities, in one of our settlements and, and have fun your own way without having to take up your own time or pay a shit ton of money. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just trying to explain how you can be part of the game sort of pre-launch and and help build my corner of the world because currently it's just me me and me so <laughs> i'd like some friends please and some help because you guys purchase the settlements around me we can all work together towards the same goal and you know just work as a cohesive whole rather than me trying to battle with the local npc mayors who want different things from me Ugh, you see where i'm going with this but anywho, if you do not want to pay that much money, again, no judgment, it, this shit gets really expensive. So if you just want to play the game, but want to support me, there are still ways you can do this. So before I showed you in the store the pledge packages, which shows you how to access the game, but now I want to show you the merchandise store. So the first way you can support me is by putting that referral code in when you sign up for Chronicles of Valeria. The other way you can support me, ignore all this, this is irrelevant to you right this second, is to go to tokens. Now, let me explain this. There are three different tokens. Guild token, tournament token, and villager token. We're ignoring guild token for now because I don't I don't own a guild, so that's irrelevant to me. You can read up on that yourself if you want to become a guild leader or contribute to a guild, that's up to you. The main one I'm looking at here is villager token. So you can purchase a maximum of three villager tokens. As you can see, I've already purchased three villager tokens. And you can donate these tokens to a player of your choice. Or you can claim them for yourself, whatever choose you choose to do. If you donate a villager token to somebody, what that does is they, they stack up. So if you've got one, just one token, it's of no use to anybody. But if you have three to five tokens, the person can then start using them during the expo exposition phase to improve their, their, their domain. In this case, because I own both the city and the county itself, I can use it. Actually, I can't use it for the county. I could only use it for my settlement. I take that back. Um, so I can use, say, three to five tokens to add a people to my city. I don't know why I'd want to do that because it's unself-sustainable at the moment, but you know, with villager tokens, I can add to the population. With villager tokens, I can also buy more land. So if I want to expand the land, maybe expand some of the farming lands I bloody need in my city, I can do that with villager tokens. It takes about three to five. It's not really set in stone the amount just yet, and it depends on the value of the land as well. The value of land will take more tokens to purchase. So that's an option. A third option they've added, but they don't haven't really specified, I can't click on it, um, in this particular page, is that it can also improve the resources in parts of your settlement, which is probably what I'll be using them for, provided I get enough to actually use. I'll be trying to enrich the resources in my city to make it more self-sustainable and to make the resources last longer over time. Because you can remember, this is, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. We're in it for the long game. So I've got to do what I can to make my entire city sustainable for a long period of time. So these villager tokens, if you understood none of that, just understand that it will help me help my city. They cost 10 US dollars each. As I said, you can buy a maximum of three and then you can send them to me under Mishka Ray, one word, if that's what you choose to do. If you wish to claim them for yourself as a settlement owner, that's that's your prerogative. But if you're not owning any land, then you can't really claim them yourself. And I would greatly appreciate any tokens you guys want to send my way because like, you saw my self-sustainability. I'm, I'm fighting an uphill battle and I need all the help I can get. Uh, 
This one's not going to matter so much because it will disappear from the store shortly, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's only there for three weeks, so uh, possibly ignore that. This is just more the one I'm looking at. So there's the two ways, actually there's three ways you can help me. You can put in the, the referral code when you sign up for the game. And you have to also, my to point out, you have to purchase a pledge. You have to actually physically purchase a pledge for me to get that credit. So you have to actually essentially buy your ticket to the game for that to count as credit. So that's one way. The second way is to, once having done that, purchase the villager tokens and send them to my account. That's another way that can help me. Um, I don't encourage that one as much as I would the first option. The first option is free for me and you just get access to the game. This one's costing you money to donate to me so I don't really encourage that one because I don't want to encourage you guys to spend money for my cause. But if you decide it's your cause too then by all means that's your second way. And your third way is to purchase a settlement during the Dutch auction in my county. That is the most expensive method to go about it, but if that's the playstyle you want to have in the game, that's how you want to approach this game and have your own settlement to run, then by all means, the land is there, <laughs> the options are there, by all means, go wild. As I said, that doesn't open until like October-ish, so you've got time to think about it, do your research, make your decisions and decide which of these, if any, are things that you would like to do. You know, this is all about you and your gaming experience. If you don't want to even play the game, then don't, That that's fine. We're not gonna force you to do it. This is just if you're interested in the game. So that, yeah, we kind of got waffly towards the end as I sort of forgot what I was trying to say and got very distracted and, you know, tangential as I tend to do. But if, if this is something you want to do, jump into it. If it's not, that's cool. I'm okay with that and I'm hoping that I will make another video shortly that will show my territory and explain its different pros and cons and what I plan to do for my community. So for each of the settlements I kind of have vague plans which is why it helps if I have mares I can discuss that with rather than NPCs who won't understand my plans. <laughs> but in another video yeah I hope to explain my, my vision for my land, my, for my domain, my county. But thanks so much for watching. I feel like this has been a really, really exceptionally long video with a shit ton of talking. I apologize. My throat is actually starting to hurt, which means I've been speaking way too much. But thanks for sticking around for the entire video. And uh, maybe I'll be seeing you soon in Chronicles of Illyria.